Are there marketing projects that you need done for your company, but you don't have enough time or people to help? Do you have a great business, but you're looking to scale? This episode is hosted by the founder of GetLeverage.com, Nick Sonnenberg. Leverage is the premier marketing platform that pairs you with a team of experts for any big or small project that you want to outsource. Dr. Jeff Gladden is a leader on disease prevention and human longevity. After treating thousands of patients as an interventional cardiologist, he made a shift to focus on prevention. He's now the founder of Apex, a comprehensive concierge medical program individually tailored to optimize health and human performance. On this episode, Jeff highlights how the Apex program is paving a new path outside of conventional healthcare. Get his view on health trends and steps you can take right now to improve your health in 2020. Also, if you're interested in attending the next Bullseye event February 5th through 7th in Austin, Texas, email team at bullseyemastermind.com with Austin in the subject line. Bullseye is an invite-only group hosted by Lee Brower and Nick Sonnenberg. This is an exclusive group for high-level entrepreneurs who are uniquely committed to building bridges that connect the very best of themselves to their highest potential in order to create significant and lasting impact. Welcome back to the Leverage Podcast. Today, I have a very special guest and a close friend of mine, Dr. Jeff Gladden. Um, I'm really excited about this conversation because Jeff, Jeff used to run a, one of the largest cardiology practices in the U.S., and now he runs a company called Apex Health out of Dallas, and he's doing some really, really cool stuff all around longevity, performance, as opposed to just the traditional sick doctors and sick care. Um, he has state-of-the-art uh, tools and methodologies and tests to, to make sure that not just dealing with an illness, but preventing it and really optimizing your performance. So welcome to the show, Jeff. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's good to be here. <clears throat> yeah, and we, we met um, through actually a bunch of people. A lot of my clients are clients of yours. I mean, I think Lee mm-hmm. Victor, um, Lee Brower, yep. et cetera. Um, and everyone speaks so, so highly uh, of you. And I had the opportunity to come to your office and, and, and help you guys out on some efficiency stuff, but also just see what you guys are doing. And it's really, it's really amazing what you've built in there. Could you maybe just sh- I, I, I'll butcher it if I try, but yeah, what, what, be what, happy do, you, to. what do you do? <laughs> and I'll, what, one thing that I w- really would love for you to share is aside from what you do, like, could you describe like what, if someone works with you, what does the first day look like? Because I think that's sure cool too. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, we can we can get to that. I think it's it's uh, it's okay with you. I'll sort of set the stage for you. So, um, you know, my background is cardiology, and I I uh, practiced that for 25 years here in Texas, <clears throat> and built my own heart group, and uh, we had about 10 offices and a A36 Bonanza, which is a little plane we used to fly around to get to different clinics. And I ended up building cath labs and starting heart programs and co-founding a heart hospital here in uh, in Plano, Texas with another cardiologist in town. And then I've been involved with several medical device companies and I'm still involved with several of those. But, you know, the thing that kind of flipped the switch for me was that I got sick in my 50s. And um, when I went to get tested, uh, I was told I was getting older. And I could not make peace with that. I could not make peace with the fact that I had reached the, the pinnacle of my life from a performance perspective and that it was going to be all downhill from here. Um, I've been, always been very athletically active, uh, really avid snowboarder and mountain biker. And, you know, I love to run and I love to surf and all these kinds of things. And it was like, <clears throat> for the first time, I thought maybe I'm not going to be able to keep up with my kids. And that was such a shocking kind of realization. I mean, I think it's something that people come come in contact with, and it's just a question of whether you acquiesce to it or you don't. And so, you know, my symptoms were really, I was putting on weight around the middle. I was so tired, I could hardly get out of bed. And when I would get really stressed, I would find myself kind of going over a cliff of anxiety and depression. And, you know, I was told, hey, you're getting older, why don't you take an antidepressant? And so what I ended up doing was kind of rejecting that advice and kind of threw myself at that point into age management medicine, functional medicine, integrative medicine, and went out and got certifications. And we continue to, you know, read at a voracious rate and attend conferences and all this sort of thing. And 
And basically what I came to realize is that I hadn't been practicing health care at all. I'd really been practicing sick care for 25 years. And it really came down to the, to the questions that, that I was asking. So, you know, in life, as you know, you really only get the answers to the questions that you're asking. And the questions I was asking were, you know, are you short of breath? Are you having chest pain? Are you dizzy and having palpitations? Um, but once I was actually able to crack the code for myself, and it probably took me two to three years to be able to crack the code <clears throat> and figure out that I had subclinical hypothyroidism that didn't show up on my blood work and that the reason I was putting weight on around the middle was I was, you know, low in testosterone and things like that, fairly common today, but a little less common then. And then the reason I would have anxiety and depression uh, and some associated brain fog was because um, my genetics were such that I don't make certain neurotransmitters very efficiently. And my dad died with dementia, right? So um, being able to sort of crack the code on that and then adjust things in a way that, that enabled me to get back to normal and actually even better than normal, I then started to ask a question, gosh, if I can feel this good now, in my mid fifties, I wonder how good I can be. I wonder how fit, how strong, how mentally sharp, and for how many years and decades can I carry this forward? Uh -huh. And so I, I ended up leaving the heart group. Uh, it's a little over seven years ago now. And, um, and I founded Apex, <clears throat> which is Apex Health, Human Performance and Longevity op Optimization, kind of a mouthful. So we just say Apex HHPLO. But <clears throat> really with that, we've, we've dedicated ourselves and I've dedicated my life quite honestly to helping answer that question. How good can we be? And so when you ask that question, then you come up with lots and lots and lots of different solutions because you, what we did was step outside of the payer system. So when you're, uh, when you're a physician, system? the payer system, the insurance, gotcha. the health insurance system, because gotcha. it's not health insurance, it's sick insurance. And when you're a physician, you know, a lot of people count on their physician to take care of them. But the problem is that uh, the physicians, we're all tied to, to uh, the health payers, right? So if they're not paying for something, then we're not thinking about it. We're not doing it. We're not exploring it for our, for our patients or clients. And consequently, there are a ton of different solutions out there that people just don't know about and don't have access to. Mm -hmm. And yet they have this preconception that, oh, I have a, I have a physician. Yeah, we do. We, I do annual checks. Yeah, I do an executive physical and they're keeping me healthy. In actual fact, they're not. What they're, what they're really doing is they're simply applying some sick care testing to see if you have disease by their criteria. And if you don't, then you're deemed to be well. So now we're talking about wellness, right. a very weak word in my estimation. You're, you're just not sick, but you're not necessarily optimal. Correct. Wellness is just not sick. It's a long ways from optimal. And so, and so basically people get <clears throat> kind of diluted almost by the verbiage, healthcare system, et cetera, into thinking that they have health when in actual fact they really don't. Um, and I think one of the problems for physicians in general is that, you know, we're all trained in a particular, particular manner and we go to good schools and we go to good residencies and fellowships and, and we get we get trained up and then we have a toolkit and we kind of get married to those answers. When I was a cardiologist, I was married to a certain set of answers, right? So one of the things I love about, go ahead. Do you think that in the future, um, these medical schools will start teaching not just sick care, but you know, how to, how to, how to be preventative, how to, uh, how to reach, you know, peak performance, kind of like what you guys are specializing in? I don't think it's going to happen in traditional medical schools uh, because they also are tied into the payers, right? Their hospitals are payer based. Their medical schools are funded to train physicians to work within that payer system. So I really, I really don't think so. And so one of the things that I love about Apex is that uh, although we have thousands of answers and we're off the grid from payers, we don't, we don't deal with insurance. Um, we're not married to any of them. We're only married to that question. How good can we be? And so we're constantly sourcing new things and new things are coming very rapidly, which is super exciting. Gotcha. It's a, it's a shame that, um, you know, be, because of things like being tied to insurance and stuff that that influences even how good doctors can be. Right. I it wonder, does. When I, yeah. I wonder if uh, medical schools can like partner down the road with like business schools at, at some of these top schools. So I don't know they get funded in a different way. 
It, it may happen, but you know, I found that the most efficient way to, and this is a little bit of the entrepreneurial piece of it, right? But the best way to move forward is not really try to change something that has tremendous momentum in one direction. It's basically just <laughs> go off on your own vector and do it, right? So, right. So, can your office is is really interesting. What I, let's just imagine I sign up right now to be your client. What is what does day one look like? Well, day one is is somewhat different for each person because uh, the way that we work with people is we we only work with people a year at a time. So people sign up with us for an entire year. Um, we before they start, we sit down and have a, a very detailed interview with them of what it is they're trying to accomplish around longevity, performance, health. And then virtually everybody that comes to us has some, some health issue that's, that they're dealing with. Either their mother had breast cancer or they've got some high blood pressure or somebody had heart disease or dementia or something, diabetes, whatever it is. And, and so we take that into account as well. And we sit down and we build out a list of services for them that really covers all the things that are gonna enable us to actually take care of the issues that they currently have but then also enables us to look at their, you know, physiology and psychology and spirituality for that matter, through the lens of how do we optimize this person's life? How does this person have their best life? And we have a very detailed conversation around that and we really kind of leave no stone unturned. And then, and then we build out a list of services that covers the, what I'll call the basics, but then also builds in, you know, what are we going to do to, to look at longevity and look at, you know, your stem cells and look at, you know, all the different elements that will translate into really extended health. And then, and then that's how we start. And then to your, to your question, they come to the office typically for a couple of days. Initially, I have to establish a physician patient relationship with them in Texas uh, to be compliant with the Texas medical board. And then they spend a couple of days with us and we do very extensive biometric testing which is basically not drawing blood or anything, but testing them on different machines, uh, testing their brain, testing their cardiovascular system, testing their resting metabolic rates, um, different things like that. And then we do um, stool, urine, blood, um, cheek swabs, et cetera, to get you know a look at their gut, a look at their all of their routine labs, but then well beyond that, you know, looking at a lot of genetics that have never been looked at before. And for the first time, when people come back about five or six weeks later to get the revelation of all that information, for the first time, they actually understand who they are. So, I mean, for example, you know, everybody has a diet plan, right? But nobody actually knows what to eat. And the problem with it is that all the diets that are out there, they all start with the food, right? Kale is good. Everybody needs butter in their coffee. You know, um, MCT oil. We all need that. We all need olive oil. Everybody needs fish oil. We all need, you know, red meat. We should be vegan. We should be, you know, pescatarian. We should be Presbyterian. You know, no, nobody really knows what to do. And so once we get done decoding the genetics and the immune system and the gut and the whole nine yards, we can actually tell somebody for the first time, hey, this is actually what you need to be eating and this is how it's going to work for you. So we provide people with a lot of clarity and confidence, quite honestly, in terms of how to move forward with optimization. And then through those tests, can you also decide, hey, you should do intermittent fasting or you should only yep. eat in these windows? Like, what, And what kind of test would you look at to, know, to, to answer that type of question in terms of time frame to eat? Not yeah, there are genetic... Yeah, there are genetic tests that tell, tell us whether or not you're likely to benefit from uh, fasting, let's say. So we get a look at that. <clears throat> yep. so, so even that, like that's, that's a popular thing to skip breakfast or to skip dinner or to only eat in a certain period of time. But even that you're saying, not, it's not a one size fits all. It's not a one size fits all. That's right. Is there, that, anything, that, is there anything that is kind of like a one-size-fits-all? Yes. Like, like not yes. eating McDonald's, I guess, is probably a one-size-fits-all? Yeah, breathing air is a good idea. Okay, and like uh, water is probably pretty, pretty cool sometimes. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah, having good water with some minerals is a good idea. Um, but actually, to your question, uh, yes, there are some things, and it's, it's, uh, it has to do with stressing the body. So there's these stressors. Uh, hermetic stressors basically that activate our longevity genes. So if you're a if you're a plant, let's say you're a seed, 
and we throw you into a, uh, you know, fertilized, you know, piece of dirt that has water and moisture and sunlight and all that sort of stuff, you're going to sprout and grow. Um, if we throw you out into a desert and there's no water and no real, you know, nutrients in that sense, then you're going to hibernate for 50 years. And when the water finally comes, then you're going to grow. So what is it that enables a seed that's going through the stress of a drought to actually survive? Well, it turns out that it's the activation of a whole set of genetics that we also have. We can activate those same longevity, right, genetics. And so those genetics get activated by stress. So I'm not talking about the kind of stress that people carry around based on their finances or their work or their family. I'm not talking about that chronic stress, which actually kills us. I'm talking about acute stresses like exercise, right? That's a, that's a stress like being in a sauna at a, over 180 degrees, um, stressing your system that way, releasing heat shock proteins that activate sirtuins, which activate FOXO, which activates all your longevity genes, P53, et cetera. So you, you want to be stressing your system and I really think that we, we've been deluded into thinking that luxury is a goal to be attained. Luxury is basically just giving away our abilities, quite honestly. Carry my bag. I'll take the elevator. Let me um, take the escalator, right? Um, pick me up in the car. I'll valet. All these different things that we think are luxuries are actually robbing us of our capabilities. Taking the stairs is so much better. Parking the distance away. Walking. Um, all those things create capability, whereas luxury actually steals it away from us. So stressing yourself, you know, with, with saunas, with the cold, with exercise, with fasting, all those things activate longevity genes. Different people will get different effects out of fasting depending on their genetics, but those stresses are universally good for us. And what about fasting without water? Is that also something that is different for different people? No. No, you, you want to keep yourself hydrated. Uh, you don't really want to get into a dehydrated state. That's, that's not particularly healthy. Gotcha. So even if you're fasting, you want to stay hydrated. Huh. I, I've heard of some people fasting, but also doing a water fast too, because they were thinking like it burns bad stuff inside of you when you don't have water. Well, a water fast is typically just drinking water. not okay. the, uh, uh, A not, fast not, without not, water. Yeah, yeah. A dry fast, I think it's called. A dry fast, yeah. A dry fast. A dry fast... Um, I'm not a big fan of a dry fast. There are some people that do water fast, and now there's actually a fast mimicking diet out there um, that's a five-day, um, it's basically a five-day fast, and you're actually eating foods that have been designed um, to not break the fast, and so you actually eating some soups and some bars and some olives and some things like that, um, but your body does go into this fasting state. And one of, the, one of the beautiful things about fasting or exercise or any of these stresses, not only does it activate your longevity genetics, but it also activates these processes where your body rejuvenates itself. It stimulates stem cells to, you know, replenish themselves. It stimulates the body clearing out the trash out of the cells, et cetera. So, so, so I know that you have a book coming out, um, and it's called How to Make 100, the New 30. And mm -hmm. I know, I know you also have a podcast called Living Beyond 120. So that's right. So is 120 really the upper limit? Or if you is that, as of right now, what you've identified or what the community has identified as the upper limit? Or could you even live technically? Like what's what's the limit of what a human body could live right now if you did everything perfectly? Well, without some of the interventions that are just now coming onto the scene. <clears throat> um, yeah, let's say that everybody did everything perfectly. They would significantly improve their health span. Um, they would make 90 look a lot different than it currently does. Um, but they wouldn't be able to crack the code on 120, quite honestly. I mean, I think the oldest person that ever lived was 122, a woman in France, uh, that's recorded, you know, apart from biblical, um, you know, individuals or that sort of thing. So I think that... Um, the reason for that has to do with uh, something called the Hayflick limit, uh, which was basically discovered by Dr. Hayflick, a physiologist back in the 50s, when they had human uh, cells that were growing in Petri dishes, and they noticed that after the cells divided a certain number of times, the population of cells would always die out. 
there were no, they would just die out. And they thought, well, we had the auger wrong. We didn't have the nutrients right. We didn't have enough. The temperature was off. Something happened and they died out. And they, they kept doing this. And he was the first one that figured out that, no, this isn't, this isn't our problem. This is a programmed event. Death is a programmed event. And it wasn't until the late 80s that it was discovered that the cause of the Hayflick limit had to do with the shortening of telomeres. And telomeres, you may have heard of, are the end caps on your chromosomes. And every time a cell divides, about five or six of those base pairs get clipped off. And so the telomeres get shorter and shorter and shorter as we go through life. And this is just one of the metrics of aging, but, but they get shorter and shorter and shorter. And as the <clears throat> telomeres get shorter, um, then the cells don't behave normally. They undergo something called senescence, and that's where they no longer divide, but they can either kill themselves at that point or, what's even more toxic, is they sit there and they spew out these toxic cytokines into the environment that can increase cancer and other at issues. A, at, at about what age do you find the cells stop dividing? Well, <clears throat> different cell populations in the body are dividing at different rates right? So your bones are dividing at a much slower rate than, say, your immune system. So senescence occurs in populations. Senescence is also part of our, a part of health. So senescence does play a role in health. It's not all bad, right? It has to do with wound healing and, uh, and triggering the immune system to actually heal things and that sort of thing. So senescence plays a role. What happens is that as we age, those senescent cells start to become a greater and greater percentage of the population. And then that leads to tissue decline and our ultimate demise. So. Gotcha. So you think 120 as of, as it stands now is the upper limit, but what you mentioned briefly that there's some new stuff that's coming out. What, yep. what is that new stuff? And what do you think that, how's that going? What's going to be the new upper limit you think? I, I think it's really <clears throat> hard to say, what the new upper limit might be, I think um, it's probably much higher than we would would even believe because the technologies are advancing at such a rate that, um, you know, the exponential exponential growth in, in knowledge and technology, so to speak, is not slowing down. And so, you know, I think if you take great care of yourself now, you'll be in great shape to take advantage of some of these newer technologies that are coming. And some of them are actually right here. We're actually getting ready to implement some of them. Um, when, but when I think say, when you say new technologies, is like CRISPR, one of the new technologies. Yeah. So it's not CRISPR. CRISPR is basically a little bit of a rough gene editing device. There are some newer techniques coming along that will probably replace, replace CRISPR for gene editing that are more precise. Um, part of the problem with CRISPR is that, um, it's a little bit of Pandora's box, right? And even the genome is Pandora's box. We don't understand what most of the genes do or why they're even there. And so when you start editing stuff, you end up with, you know, unintentional consequences. And so nobody knows exactly what those are yet. So that's a little bit tricky. I think that right now, what our feeling is that keeping your telomeres long, keeping your DNA young, and there are ways to measure the age of your DNA, um, and there was recently a study showing that in men between the ages of 50 and 65, there were only nine of them, it was a small study, but for a year they put them on a combination of growth hormone, DHEA, and metformin. Um, and what they found is that after a year, they were, their DNA was a year and a half younger than when they started. So it was a two and a half year delta. <clears throat> so that's actually pretty, pretty intriguing. We can already make telomeres longer. And we're now coming up with senolytics, which are basically compounds and combinations of compounds that will um, prune senescent cells. Um, and some of the compounds really are, have you know, laser-like, sniper-like accuracy and specificity. So we're, we're excited to think that we can do that. Then the other thing you need to have is you need to have young stem cells. And there are ways now to rejuvenate your stem cells, um, take them out of the body, click about four genetic boxes, and you can make the stem cells young again, put them back into yourself, and that leads to more rejuvenation. Part of the reason we die too is we exhaust our stem cell supply. And senescent cells usually are replaced by uh, stem cells in the end, um, but when that stem cell population is exhausted, then the, the senescent cells predominate, right? So. 
So those are, those are some of the major levers right now. And there'll be other ones that are coming as well. I have a friend, um, they're about to have a, a baby actually in a week from now. Um, do you suggest people freeze the umbilical cord or like, is there anything when people are born that, that, that they should do? You know, uh, people talk about snoring stem cells. <clears throat> There's probably no downside to it. Uh, but quite honestly, I think we're going to be able to rejuvenate cells. We can already rejuvenate cells. And so I think all of us that never had our, <clears throat> you know, our amniotic fluid or umbilical stem cells saved or any of that sort of thing, I don't think we're, I don't think we're that much worse off. I don't think we're that far behind the curve. We're all going to die and only this select few will continue. Yeah, only this, on you know, 0.11% <laughs> that are doing yeah. that are going to, yeah, I don't think that's actually how it's going to play out. Gotcha. Um, so... Are there some common things? So I know you said everyone's different. Diet is different. It's all based off of your genetics, right? And how you specifically are. But are there some supplements like just in general that you found like 90 something percent of people should just be taking? Yeah, one is molecular hydrogen. Um, molecular where would, hydrogen. Get, where would you get that from? Well, there's a product coming out called H2 Max, which will have the maximum strength of of hydrogen. Um, you can find hydrogens on, um, on Amazon or other places. Um, and full disclosure, it's one that we're bringing forward out of living beyond 120. Uh, we're, we're actually very excited about that. You're what we be love making this? Yeah, we're going to be making it um, and bringing it to market. The, one of the things that we love about hydrogen, though, and this had, you know, I fell in love with hydrogen long before I ever thought we were going to bring something to market. Um, this is probably about four or five years ago when I first learned about it. Hydrogen is an amazing molecule. It actually balances the entire redox system. So you're probably aware that people think there's too much oxidative stress. And if you just take a lot of antioxidants, you'll live longer. And all the studies that have looked at that show that people die sooner. So that's clearly not, not the thing, right? And if you want to, if you want to stress your system, part of that stress is increasing oxidative stress from exercise or that sort of thing. And oxidative stress comes from making energy, making ATP, and it becomes a byproduct of that process. It's like the exhaust coming off of a car. It's just a, a natural byproduct. It's, it, it's part of what actually the body responds to to get stronger. So using ozone therapy is another way to provide yourself with oxidative stress that enables you to get stronger. So what hydrogen does is it doesn't, it's not just an antioxidant. It's the perfect it's the perfect adaptogen to balance the redox system, the reduction and oxidative system, if you will. <clears throat> and that turns out to be, I think, hugely important, not only for mitochondrial health and energy production, but for longevity. So we're, we're very, very interested in that. And we've been doing some research on hydrogen, um, mapping its pathways and the things that it affects. And it also appears to have an impact on pain. It also, um, seems to have an impact on inflammation. Um, and so virtually everybody we see, we do put on hydrogen, molecular hydrogen. And is there any others that like, I, I know fish oils has, like, has, is, a popular, is a popular topic. What are your thoughts on that? Pros and cons, depends on who you are. <clears throat> okay, gotcha. um, yeah, depends on who you are. Um, are I, there some other common ones that most people should be taking? Um, that everybody should be taking. Well, I think as people go through life, one of the issues from my cardiology background is that their blood vessels don't work as well. Um, and that's because the skin that lines the blood vessels, um, which is really the control center for the blood vessel, decides whether the blood vessel is going to dilate or constrict. Um, keeping that skin, which is called the endothelium, keeping that skin that lines the artery, the inside of the artery, healthy is critical. And so Increasing nitric oxide production becomes important, um, and you can do that with um, eating a high nitrate diet, foods that are high in dietary nitrate, like kale and arugula and beets and things huh. like that. Because I've and seen you, that I've seen at supermarkets like bacon, where they say no nitrates. So is is nitrates a good thing, except in bacon? Uh, it's not nitrates; it's nitrites. Oh, oops. Yeah. See, that's why so I'm not a doctor. <laughs> there you go. But dietary nitrates are actually super healthy for us. So those gotcha. vegetables are super healthy. Eating more plant-based is also a great recommendation, right? And then one of the other things that David Sinclair has brought up recently is that increasing NAD, uh, a molecule called 
uh, NAD basically improves your mitochondrial function and it also activates your longevity genes. So there are different ways to boost NAD um, and that can be done through nicotinamide riboside or through nicotinamide mononucleotide, NMN. And um, so that's something that I think works well for virtually everybody. If you have cancer though, because the NMN does improve blood flow and vasculature, you want to probably stay away from it. So I hesitate to say that there's one thing that's good for everybody, um, right. but that's something that's, that's helpful. So. so every once in a while, I'll get one of those like IV treatments where it gives you like a bunch of vitamins and glutathione. And I think NAD yep. now is like one of the add-ons that you could do in, in some of those bags. Yep. That's right. Yeah. NAD does a lot of remarkable things. It's used for drug addiction, alcohol withdrawal. Um, it can be helpful for people that have chronic diseases, you know, where mitochondrial function is diminished. Um, and we've also, we've learned a lot about mitochondrial function. I don't know how deep you want to go on the technical side of this, but a lot of diseases are due to people being stuck in not being able to actually complete the healing cycle. Um, and it has to do with mitochondrial function. I, I won't well, I get too Dave, far off the rails. Well, I know, like, uh, I read Dave Asprey's book or one of, one of them, and it was all basically, I think it was Headstrong, the last one, where it was all about the importance of mitochondria. Mm -hmm. It just turns out that the mitochondria <clears throat> do a lot more than what people think. They're not just the powerhouses of the cell. They're actually the sentinels for our body in terms of uh, uncovering uh, threats, if you will. And so when a threat is detected, they, they actually sense redox and they sense electrical energy extremely well. And when they sense a uh, bacteria, a virus, a chemical, something that's a threat, they go into a, a cellular defense response and they actually shut down making ATP. Hmm. It's one of the reasons that you feel tired when you're sick. You're making a lot less ATP. And then they go through a whole cycle of one, two, three with two different partitions to actually take you back to health to the point where they're actually making ATP again. And it's, it's people that get stuck in those various phases that actually end up with chronic diseases, whether it's Lyme's or mold or these kinds of things. Those are actually traceable back now to people getting stuck in different phases of healing where they can't actually heal. Hmm. Yep. Interesting. Um, what are your thoughts on coffee? I drink quite a bit of coffee. Is that, is that an issue or is that, is this one of the things where it's like, maybe it is, maybe it isn't, I need to do more. Yeah, for some people, they can drink coffee all day long and they're fast metabolizers and, you know, have your way with it. Uh, for other people, it's actually a cardiovascular risk. So it just depends on how you metabolize it. Yeah. Okay. And how would you find that out? Like you would come in and- Genetic tests. Genetic. Yeah. Be part of, it would just come out. We wouldn't test for that specifically. It just shows up in one of the, you know, one of the many panels that we do. So if so, where would someone go to get genetic testing? Is it something you could get at your regular doctor? Is it just a handful of places and, and Apex is one of them? Yeah, I mean, your regular doctor won't be asking the right questions. Uh, they'll be asking what's covered by insurance, right? If right. you're asking the question, how good can I be, then they're not the person to talk to. If you go online and do some of the direct-to-consumer stuff, they're very much handicapped by uh, what the FDA will allow them to report. They're also not doing full genome sequencing. They're only testing a few SNPs, if you will, or a few sections of the DNA, uh, looking for some changes in those SNPs and then reporting out, you know, hair color and things like that. So it's a little bit tougher to get actually really good actionable information unless you go through a clinic that's actually, you know, focused on unraveling the genome. And, and it turns out that genes are not, are not, the total story either because our genes really are not our destiny. It's the environment the genes reside in that determines how they're expressed, but you have to know what the genes are. So you know how to manipulate the environment so that they become optimally expressed. But, you know, you need to work with somebody um, that basically uh, understands, you know, how to do this. And, uh, and I won't, there are other layers to all this, but, but that's, that's gotcha. a good enough answer. Yeah. Gotcha. All right. So coffee, case by case basis. What about plant medicine is becoming more and more popular these days? Marijuana, mm -hmm. psilocybin. Like, what are your thoughts on plant medicines? 
Or you can well, say no comment if I'm like uh, asking too weird. Yeah, no, no, no. No, I think, I think, you know, most all medications come from plants, quite honestly. Yeah. So, you know, the history of medicine is basically plant-based medicine. <clears throat> Even pharma uh, is plant-based medicine. It's just modified so they can have a patent, patented molecule, right? So, um, you know, I think plant-based medicines do play a role. Um, one of the things that um, I think people need to understand is that pharma in general, whether it's plant-based or pharma-based, is based on a model of interrupting a biochemical pathway. So let's say you're, you're having inflammation. Um, then the drug or whatever we're using is designed to go in and interrupt that chemical pathway. And the problem with that is now the chemicals have to go somewhere so you end up with side effects or you end up with other things, right? What I think is a much better scenario for healing is basically using things that amplify the body's ability to heal itself. Because it's really, there's nothing more powerful than the body's ability to heal itself. We don't have anything that comes close to that, right? So really the way that we approach it is trying to reduce uh, things with a lot of plant-based um, supplements uh, if they're needed. But then we also use signaling peptides to actually help amplify the body's ability to heal itself. And those are very, very powerful. So we've had tremendous success with those. And they kind of dovetail into the whole regenerative space where you're using those with stem cells, et cetera. So, so what's a signaling peptide? Is that like a... Yeah, a signaling peptide. Um, well, everybody's familiar with a protein. A protein is, um, you know, a string of amino acids. And it's long enough that... It's usually 100 amino acid base pairs. It's like lining up Legos, you know, and building something. A peptide is a string of amino acids, but it's typically only about 50 amino acids long or less. And so that is what's called a peptide. So think of it as a portion of a protein. Um, we have peptides in our body, lots of peptides in our body. Insulin is a peptide hormone, right? Insulin basically signals the body to do a whole host of things, but it's a, it's a peptide. So it turns out that there are other peptides that can help accelerate healing, things that can heal the gut, things that can improve brain function. Everybody's interested in nootropic stacks. Well, you can bypass the nootropic stacks and go straight to, hey, let's make the brain function optimally with peptides. So, so how do I get more peptides? <laughs> you have to see somebody that can prescribe them. Um, there are a lot of peptides on the internet. You can go buy them for research purposes only. And the data shows that 90% of what you're ordering, you're not getting what you think you are. So, you know, buyer beware. Gotcha. Um, but there are pharmacies out there that do sell peptides. And if you go through a physician that can write a prescription into the pharmacy, you can get peptides that are really super high quality. So, so, so. so that's part of what you're giving some of your patients when it makes sense or some of these peptides? Absolutely. Yeah. When, and, and for when, brain performance, that's one of the number one things that you found can help with brain performance? Well, brain performance depends on <clears throat> understanding your genetics and how you make neurotransmitters. You're not really going to have mental clarity and sharpness until you get those pieces right. But then you can actually augment it dramatically with um, peptide juice. Wow. So, mm -hmm. Man, there's so much stuff that pretty much no one knows about except for you. Right? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's interesting. Again, it's, it's, it's the questions that you're asking, right? I mean, yeah. how do I know this stuff? It's because we're asking the question, how good can we be? So, no, yeah, it's, a, it's a really good empowering question. And, and lastly, what about, uh, obviously, it's not going to be as robust as what you, you're doing, but what about some of these like tests that you could do at home, like Viome or some of these other ones? Yeah, if, so if I someone, think- If someone doesn't have a huge budget, what could they do right now? to still kind of make a bit of progress and move one step in the right direction? I think understanding your gut biome is important. I think biome, uh, and we've, I've seen a lot of biome reports come back. The problem with biome is the problem that most technologies have is that they want to take a single result and extrapolate it across a wide range of recommendations. Like you should be eating all these foods because this is your gut biome. Well, we know that's just not true either. We know it's not true because, you know, maybe you're not digesting proteins properly. Maybe you're not digesting fats properly. Maybe you've got other things going on. And so the, maybe you've got food sensitivities and your immune system is reacting to it. So even though your bacteria may want it, it may be making you sicker than it's making you healthier. So until you actually get a complete picture of what's going on, it's really, really difficult to, 
to make a recommendation. I think, you know, God bless everybody. We're, we're all trying and we're all quite honestly working with partial knowledge. Um, but it's, it's hard to, and you can go online, you know, you can do ancestry.com, you can run it through NutraHacker, you can do other things like that, but you're still left with as many questions as you are answers. That's, that's part of the problem. So, well, one of the things we're doing with LB120, Living Beyond 120, is to try to democratize this information. And I'm working on a project now to where we can actually democratize access to this kind of stuff. So that's part of the book, How to Make 100 to New 30. A lot of that will be esoteric information about how you can actually do that, but actionable. And there'll be an audience for that. But then the next phase is how do we democratize this so that more and more people can do it? Because I want millions of people to be able to benefit from this. Um, yeah, and then the side effect is we'll have overpopulation. We'll deal with that when that when that time comes. But well, we'll just have a we'll just have a very productive society. That's right? true. That's true. Yeah, I, I mean, imagine a world where everyone's just healthy with clear brain function and right. Yeah, yeah. At that point, if we get overpopulated, we'll probably be smart enough to figure out how to live in Mars, exactly. live on Mars or something. It, well, we, I don't think we'll need to. <laughs> I think we'll be smart enough to figure out how to do what needs to get done. Right. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, for sure. Are there any books that you would recommend people picking up and buying just to learn a little bit more about general health and how to how to stay stay fit? I don't know. I think I don't think uh, this is it's going to sound like it's really self promoting, but um, but I think you know I've read a lot of the books, tons of them, and um, I think the book that I'm about to bring out is actually going to be uh, a better blueprint than most of them. You know, even some of the big authors that come out, you read the book and there's not really too much content in there. Um, so I, I think people will be pleased uh, because I, I really want to make this available and to where it's actionable, not just sort of tease you with, hey, there's stuff coming. I want to actually show you what's going on. Gotcha. Well, I'm, I'm ex- when is that book coming out? Uh, it should be out the first quarter of next year. Oh, okay. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah. And you're going to help me publish it. It sounds like I'm going to help you release that. And then if you do come to my bullseye event in February, which I hope you do, um, uh, I'll buy a copy for everyone that's, mm-hmm. that's coming. Oh, perfect. Yeah. Perfect. So um, I really, I want to be respectful of your time. Um, Jeff, where can people find out more about you? Yeah. So um, the podcast is a good place living beyond one, two, zero. That's the website for that living beyond one, two, zero.com. Uh, we have a, been doing it for a couple of years. There's a bunch of great podcasts there. You'll learn a lot about a lot of topics there and more about me. And then if you want to learn more about the practice, um, go to Apex, A-P-E-X, then it's H-H-P-L-O.com. And, uh, and there, if you're interested to talk to us, if you really want to pursue what we do, then uh, we'll send you something you could fill out and then we'll set up a call and we can chat through what your concerns are and explain to you how, how we work and, and see if we're a fit. So. Yeah. I, I can't speak more highly about you and what you do. I think, you know, so long as uh, you can afford it, everyone should, should do this because it's, you know, it, nothing's more important than your health. Yeah. Thank exactly. you so much. Mon- yep. I was just going to say money is just a resource, quite honestly. I mean, right. what's the point of making money if, uh, if you're not spending it on things like this uh, and increasing mm-hmm. your performance and your health? Yeah, and I think one thing we've all done is leverage our health for the sake of earning money, right? We've yeah. all done that. We've all leveraged our health. And then you get to a point where it's like, you know what, it's time to leverage the resource to maintain my health or actually improve it. So, For sure. All right. Well, thank you very much for your time and look forward to seeing you in a couple months. Sounds great. Thanks so much. Appreciate it, Nick. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the Leverage Podcast from GetLeverage.com. Please let us know what you think. Rate and subscribe on iTunes. Leverage is an on-demand outsourcing platform that helps small business owners and entrepreneurs scale their business. We have experts that can help set up marketing and sales funnels, your email marketing, podcasts, social media creation, paid media, and much more. Grow your business overnight with a team of experts you can trust to deliver. Accomplish more. Visit getleverage.com.